morning. Uh, so this is the last day of uh, this lecture series. Uh, and in fact, today uh, it's the best. So in principle, you, you, you should enjoy what we are doing today. So first of all, we have to learn how to do uh, model analysis in, in uh, enclosures, uh, in confined places, uh, and to generalize, in fact, the analysis that we did previously for very simple waves in ducts. So uh, what we've done here is to look at uh, simple cases. The first one is, of course, to, to look at the, uh, uh, a rectangular cavity. So uh, what, we, what we are doing here is modal analysis, modal identification. What are the frequencies, the resonance frequencies, and what are the distributions that correspond to these frequencies? So the, uh, the first case is the rectangular cavity. For example, this room is is not quite rectangular, but uh, some other rooms are. This one would be more complicated. This one, if you want to calculate the modes, you should use a, a COMSOL or a solver, a direct uh, numerical solver using finite elements, and, and you can actually uh, account for this complicated geometry. But in this simple case, so we look at, uh, at the modes uh, of this uh, situation, we consider that the walls are rigid, so all the walls are rigid, and, uh, and this is the boundary condition that the gradient of psi, the function that we are looking for, is equal to zero. The normal gradient is equal to zero, and also we have to, uh, this uh, function psi has to satisfy the, the Helmholtz equation. You know, this is the, the Helmholtz equation. And uh, to find this, uh, in this case, uh, you can always try to get a solution for, for this problem. So I, I wrote this problem explicitly here with all the boundary conditions here. And uh, the method that you can use, that you can try to use, is separation of variables. You, you, you express the function psi as a product of a function of x, a function of y, a function of z, and then uh, you, you bring that expression into the, the, the wave equation, the, the Helmholtz equation, and divide by x, y, z, and you get this, this expression. And then you find out that you cannot uh, solve that if, you, if these quantities are not constants, because this is a function of x, that's a function of y, that's a function of z, and it won't work unless this is a constant, this is a constant, this is a constant. And we write the constants as minus kx square, minus ky square. You can choose what, you can write the constant as you want. This is uh, easier to write it like that, and afterwards you will see that it works, everything's fine. But you can put that in a different way. So, uh, when you do that, you, you get k square is equal to the, this sum of kx square plus ky square plus kz square. And now, the, uh, uh, you, you can try to solve the first problem, this one, uh, with the boundary condition x prime of 0 is equal to 0, x prime of lx is equal to 0. And, uh, and you find that uh, x is equal to cosine of kx times x. And, uh, and the value of kx is uh, defined by sine of kx lx is equal to zero when you apply the second boundary condition. So kx will be a multiple of pi over lx. And so you can write down the, the mode. This is uh, how it looks with a constant in front of it, if you want, m, n, q. And, uh, and the angular frequencies corresponding to this mode are, are written here. And from these angular frequencies, you can get the frequencies themselves. You know that uh, 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 omega is equal to 2 pi f. So the frequencies are given like that. And for example, if you set n is equal to 0, q is equal to 0, and n different, you have mc over 2lx. These are the halfway modes. Uh, these are just plain waves. But uh, when m, n, and q are, are take different values, you have all the other modes. So this gives you the set of uh, eigenmodes in this system.
You see, th that was what we did yesterday. Uh, so it's just uh, coming back to that. You go like that, and afterwards you, you get that solution. And finally, well, you, you see I used here notation M and Q, while here I used N, X, N, Y, N, Z, but it's very similar. And, uh, and you can calculate all these modes. So for example, you take a small box and you consider that uh, it's filled with air, the temperature is 2000 K because it's combustion, and then you look at the frequencies and you can find uh, 2000 Hertz, 4000, 5000, 6000, 6700, and so on. So you can get a precise value of all these frequencies and you have the, sh the mode shapes as well. All right, any question on, on this derivation? So now we, we have to look at um, a little more complicated uh, cavities. For example, cylindrical cavities. Uh, why cylindrical? Because some devices are cylindrical. Uh, you have, for example, this is a cylinder. Uh, the, the size of this cylinder is L, and the, the radius is R. And so now uh, the, uh, the problem is best written uh, in terms of uh, uh, cylindrical coordinates. So you, we use here the, the x-axis, I think. Let's see. Uh, no, the z-axis. Uh, I will call that z. Z, then we have the radius R somewhere here, and the angle theta right here. And, uh, and the Laplacian in this case can be written as uh, uh, D2P, D, D2 psi by D uh, R squared plus one over R D psi by D R plus one over R squared D two psi by D theta squared plus D two psi by D Z squared plus K squared is equal to zero. So this time, uh, so psi is a function of the radius, the angle, and Z. And uh, again, we can try to, to get an expression where we separate the variables. R of R times theta. This is a big theta of small theta. And then Z of Z. So we place that in this expression. And uh, so let's go here. And we divide by, by this uh, quantity by this product. So what we get is the following. One over R, big R, D2R by DR squared plus one over R, small r, big R, dr by dr, plus one over r square, big theta, d theta, d2 theta by dt theta square, <coughs> plus d2z, one over z, by dz square, plus k square is equal to zero. And uh, again, we do the same, <laughs> we do the same um, uh, reasoning. Uh, you find out very rapidly that this has to be a constant. Uh, let's call that, how, how do I call that? Um, 
kz, kz minus kz squared. And here we find that this has to be a constant as well, one over theta d2 theta by d theta squared. Uh, has to be, oops, this is a d theta square. And this will be a constant that we will call m square, minus m square. And, uh, and then r, the, uh, so we, we, we get the following expression, one over small r, big R, dr, by the r, d2, uh, sorry, 1 over r, d2 r by dr square, plus 1 over small r, big r, dr by dr. Uh, and then we have plus 1 over r square, but we have a minus, so it's minus m square. Um, minus kz square and minus and plus k square is equal to zero. It's a little more complicated as soon as you get into this uh, uh, radial coordinates. This uh, it becomes just a little more complicated, and all this, yeah, this is it. So finally, the uh, the system of equations that we have to solve. So some of them are very easy. Some, some we have already solved. For example, the, the function for z is very simple. It satisfies d2z by dz square plus kz square z is equal to 0. And the, uh, let's assume that the, uh, the, the cylinder is, is uh, made of rigid walls, that everything is rigid. So we have uh, uh, z of uh, z prime of zero is equal to zero, and z prime of uh, um, of l is equal to zero. I think that's yeah. Uh, for theta, we have the same very simple equation d two theta. It's a second order differential equation plus m square theta is equal to zero. And for the radial, for the radial uh, equation, what we have is d2r by dr square plus uh, 1 over r dr by dr plus, so I'm going to call k per perpendicular k square minus kz square plus k perpendicular here square minus m square over r square times r is equal to 0. All right. So we, we have here these equations. You see, we, we did this separation of variables, and we have three equations which are separated. So this one is a function of z. This is a function of theta. This is a function of uh, r. Uh, and we, in, the, in the way, it's good to, to use this expression. Why do you, we call that k perpendicular? Because it's the wave number. You see it's the wave number, but we subtracted the longitudinal part of this wave number. So what remains, it's the, the part which corresponds to the plane perpendicular to the z-axis. And uh, these equations, these two equations are very simple to solve. This one is a little more difficult. You recognize perhaps the Bessel equation. This is the Bessel differential equation. We will look at the solutions of that uh, as a second point. So let's look first at uh, z. 
So uh, for the Z equation, you have these two boundary conditions and you get immediately Z as cosine KZ Z and KZ itself is Q times pi over L. Q has to be uh, an integer. So, uh, so this is solved immediately. Take a look now at this, well, yeah, there is a small difference between what is in, on the blackboard and what is here. I, I call it N there, so let's change M into N. So all of this is, yeah, let's assume that it's N here. And, uh, and what, what is the condition on theta? Theta has to be a function periodic with respect to two pi. That's the only thing you know, it's as you make a turn, you have to get back to the same function. So, uh, so you can get immediately the, the shape of theta. And you have two components. One is e to the plus i n theta, and the other one is e to the minus i n theta. Now take a look at this radial problem. Uh, the condition is that uh, on the wall, the, this, uh, the derivative of r should be equal to zero. Now, the solutions of that expression are just written as follows. You have the Bessel function, Jn. So you see it depends on the n, which is the, the value, which is here. n has to be a, an integer because of the, the periodicity condition. n has to be an integer, otherwise you don't have the periodicity. So you have Jn, and then you have a Yn. These are the two basic uh, solutions of that expression here. You see this is the Bessel equation. And uh, what, we, what is known is that the limit of Yn as r goes to zero is infinity. So this is not physical. You cannot accept that. So you can say immediately that b is equal to zero. You see yn is singular at r is equal to zero. So this one, you cannot use that. And so you are just left with the Bessel function here. The Bessel function is more or less like a, a sinusoidal function. It, it, it's more complicated. It has a, uh, a special shape, but it's very close to a, a sinusoid, let's say. So uh, the, the condition on the wall is that j prime, so the derivative of j, at the wall uh, of, with this argument, so the, the radius of this uh, cylinder is A, so this has to be equal to zero. And so you, know, you need to know the, the values that bring this derivative to zero. Let's call them alpha m n. They, they are a function of n, which is the, 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 the azimuthal uh, number, and m is the, the, the m's uh, 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 root of that expression. And so k perpendicular mn has to be alpha mn divided by a. And uh, sometimes people prefer to use beta mn, which is such that pi beta mn is the root of that expression then k perpendicular mn is equal to pi beta mn divided by a. And so finally, the, 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 uh, the mode shape is given by the Bessel function with the k perpendicular mn's given by this expression, cosine q pi z over l. This is the, uh, the axial distribution. And then you have two waves coming in, a e to the i n theta, and b to the i, uh, well, there is a minus sign missing here, sorry. There is a, there is a minus here. So finally, the, uh, the eigenfrequencies are, uh, they have three numbers here, m and q, uh, two numbers for this k perpendicular and one number for the kz square. And so this gives you the frequencies. And as a consequence, you can get the frequencies for the cylindrical cavity. So we know very well the distribution. We know the frequencies of such a cavity. So again, it's, it tells you how to look for uh, eigenfunctions, eigenfrequencies 
of uh, cylindrical cavities. Any questions on that? So, yeah. You, what you do is you, you operate at a constant frequency. It's as if you were doing a Fourier transform and looking and looking at each of the frequencies. Yes. You, you, uh, what, what, this is one, you know, you can, you say, for example, I have a signal which, which is all the frequencies. I make a Fourier transform and I get uh, a problem for a given frequency. And we solve the problem for the given frequency. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about rocket combustion. Yes. When you have a solid propeller, how is that ignited and how does that oh. fuel burn up into the rocket as it gets okay. All right. So uh, ignition there uh, is, uh, I think there is an igniter which produces the initial flame and you try to ignite the whole uh, segment. You know, just, you, you need to ignite the whole surface of your uh, solid propellant. So that what you, what you do want is that the propellant will burn equally well up to the, uh, the outer boundary. You don't want to have some propellant uh, reaching the boundary while the other has not yet reached. Uh, so you, you need a, a homogeneous uh, burning. To do that, uh, what you need, and also what you need is to have a, a, an essentially constant pressure inside the rocket. So for that, the surface that is being consumed continuously has to be um, uh, designed so that you keep an essentially constant surface. But how is that? Because you have a cylinder. You see the, if you, so th that's not quite related to this, but uh, let's, uh, th this is a cross section of your rocket. If you put the solid propellant like that, initially the surface is this one. At a later point, it will be like that. So the surface is increasing here. And uh, if, you, if you do that, the pressure will be increasing because you, you burn more, uh, this, this burns directly in the radial direction at a certain rate. So as you, as you go along, uh, the pressure would increase in the, in the, in the rocket. So uh, instead of that, what, uh, what is done is, for example, to, to give a, a certain a shape. Well, it's difficult to, to draw, but it's like that. And yeah, and when you stop burning, you have a surface which is like that. And little by little, this surface uh, is displaced. I don't know how. And you keep more or less a constant surface. So the design is to, is to get a constant surface. Some, some rockets are like that. Just to bring you back to this example. Yes. It, it will, yes, yeah, you, you change, uh, you can, you, yes, that's right. And so you actually, you, you, you will have to, to, uh, to take into account this change in frequency, that the, the resonance frequency. Yes, yes, yeah. All right, so we, we have the cylindrical cavity and now we go to the annular cavity because we are interested in annular uh, combustors. And uh, yeah, th this just gives you uh, a homework. If you want, you can calculate your, uh, the values of, so you have to look at the table of the, uh, the roots of the Bessel function. In fact, it's the derivative of the Bessel function, but you can get them. So anyway, it's, it's given as a homework. Right, so now let's, let's move to the uh, annular cavity. The annular cavity, again, is, uh, this is uh, really interesting from a practical point of view because we have many combustors which are annular. Now, the difference with the previous case is that usually this annulus, the, the distance between the two walls is small compared to the radius.
you have a, uh, an inner wall here. And we have an outer wall like that. And, uh, and the, the average radius, sorry, the radius from, from here to here to the, to the central surface here, R, is big uh, compared, to, uh, compared to this, to the distance between these two walls. So basically, we can neglect the, the dependence on the radius. We can say, well, the radius is just about R, and we can just look at, uh, at a, a Helmholtz equation now written as follows, so we have d2p by uh, dr square, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, let, let's, let's go back to, to the time uh, right here, uh, let's put one over c square right here, and then what we have is uh, d2p by d theta square, and here we have one over r square, and uh, minus d2p by dz square. We neglect, in this case, it's reasonable because usually this, the two, you can also do the analysis, everything complete, and you will find the Bessel functions and so on, but if you have this condition satisfied, in general, the radial dependence with, will be very small, and, and so you can simplify the problem. So let's do it like that. And so uh, the Helmholtz equation becomes, in this case, uh, c square. Uh, well, let's put it uh, d2, uh, d2 psi by d theta square, 1 over r square. R is a constant, plus d2p by dz, uh, d2 psi by dz square plus omega 2 over c square, and this we call k square is equal to zero times times psi is equal to zero, and. Uh, what we have, again, we can, we can do a separation of variables. So we write psi as a function of theta and z. We consider that with respect to r, it's a constant. It doesn't change very much because this is small compared to the radius. So this becomes a function of theta and a function of z. And uh, when we do that, we, we put that into this equation, we have uh, the following. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's do it first uh, in a simple manner. Let's consider first that there is no dependence on z. So we, we just consider the waves which are propagating in the theta direction. So let's consider that this term is vanishes. There is no, nothing there. So we look at the azimuthal modes and you see immediately that the, uh, the function theta, d2 theta by dt square, d theta square, uh, 1 over r square, uh, and divided by 1 over theta, uh, plus k square, is equal to zero. So um, in this case, it's very similar to the uh, to what happens in the cylinder. Uh, in this case, what we have is that uh, d two theta by d theta square 
plus k square r square theta is equal to 0. And, uh, and so theta is equal to e to the i kr theta plus e to the minus i kr theta. And, uh, and immediately you see that uh, these solutions, this is a theta, uh, these solutions have to be uh, periodic as well. So theta of theta has to be theta of theta plus 2 pi modulo 2 pi. So uh, kr have to be equal to, let's say, n, n. Otherwise, if this is not an integer, it doesn't work. You don't have the periodicity. So kr has to be uh, an integer. And finally, you find that theta is equal to, well, there is a constant here, a and b here. So theta has to be e to the i n theta plus b e to the minus i n theta. So, uh, so the, the azimuthal solution is just something like that. So this is formed by two waves. You have two waves propagating. One is propagating in the, in the positive direction, and the other one is propagating in the negative direction. And it's a combination of these two waves which makes a solution for this uh, azimuthal, for this uh, annular case. We have theta is equal to a e to the i n theta minus i omega t. Let's not forget that we have this uh, dependence on time. And then we have a wave which propagates in the other way minus i n theta minus i omega t. So, uh, and uh, what we know, we know that kr is equal to, to n. Now k is equal to omega over c, omega c over times r, and all this has to be equal to n. So that uh, 2 pi f, so the frequency f is equal to uh, times 2 pi r over c is equal to n. And as a consequence, uh, the frequency f, fn, corresponding to one of these modes, is equal to n times c divided by 2 pi r, which is the perimeter. So that's a very simple expression to remember. It's the, the, the speed of sound divided by the perimeter of your system. And uh, what is interesting is that these modes, because the perimeter usually is the largest dimension, the frequencies are the lowest. And, uh, and as they are the lowest, they are in the range where the flames can, be, uh, can, can respond. And so uh, it, is, it is important to, to look at these azimuthal modes. And uh, w one thing also which is interesting is to see what is the speed of rotation of this, uh, of this quantity. So let's take a look at that, e to the i n theta minus uh, c over p um, times uh, 2 pi. Uh, so let's, uh, let's put here c over r. Um, and this is t. And you see that um, uh, this will rotate 
if I take d theta by dt, this is the phase here. So the rotation will be uh, at a, um, uh, this will be c over r. And, uh, and if I now multiply to get the velocity of this wave by r, this will be c. So the, this mode, this, this wave rotates at the speed of sound. So the rotation is at the speed of sound. Yeah. So these are modes which are purely azimuthal. And now you can have also, and this, how, this is how they look. Now, it, it's all a problem of combination of these two quantities, A and B. For example, if you say A is equal to 1, and b is equal to uh, minus 1. Uh, you get this, this mode. It's a standing mode. You get, a, uh, you get a, this sort of standing mode. Uh, there is a, a, a nodal line where the pressure is equal to 0, shown in red. And on one side, you have uh, positive, while on the other side, you have negative. So this is a, a standing mode. If, for example, A is equal to 1 and B is equal to 0, you have a, a mode which rotates in the positive direction. If you have B is equal to 1 and A is equal to 0, you have a mode which rotates in the other direction. And if you have in between, well, it's something which rotates, but uh, it's not quite, uh, it's not a spinning mode as we, we know it, or the other way. It's, it's in between. We'll see that now uh, in, the, in the next, uh, in the next uh, slides. Uh, so now if, if we have also the longitudinal part, uh, well, you get functions, psi m here. And of course, it depends on the boundary conditions. If this is rigid, this is open because this is now more or less our combustor, uh, you get also uh, a, 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 an axial part of the, of the mode, which looks like cosine of mz, and, uh, and uh, the kms, which are here, are a function like that. We've already calculated things like that. And so the, the frequencies are combinations of something which is azimuthal and something which is axial. And uh, these are the combinations that we get. If the mode is purely axial, for example, the first one zero, that is uh, the case where n is equal to zero and m is equal to one, you get c over 4l. This is the quarter wave longitudinal mode. Uh, the first azimuthal mode and the, uh, and the first quarter wave longitudinal is c over four, uh, p uh, over, uh, over the perimeter square plus c over four l square to the half. So this gives you already a good idea of what, what the modes are in this combustor. You, you may have a purely azimuthal modes and you may have modes which are mixed, which contain a longitudinal part and the azimuthal part. In fact, in this configuration, we have the two. We have this, uh, the mixed modes which appear like that. Any question on this? We will, we will see that uh, now in practice. In, uh, this, this was just to give a, a background on the frequencies, the distribution. All right, so let's, let's move to the next. So the, the image here shows you the combustor that we, we now are going to study. And, uh, and what you see here are the multiple injectors. We have 16 injectors all around. 
And uh, to get that very nice picture, we, we place here, instead of having a quartz window, we placed a, a, uh, a steel uh, cylinder. And so this is heated by combustion. And like that, you can see how, the, how it's heated by the flames and, uh, and the shape that it takes. And, uh, and so the other window is, is made of quartz. All right, so the, the point is that uh, annular combustors are very important in gas turbines, in aircraft engines. Uh, in these devices, uh, oscillations may be coupled by azimuthal modes. We've, we've just seen some of these azimuthal modes. They may occur in cylinders. They may occur in annular sy uh, systems. And now, because the diameter is, uh, in general, the largest dimension, the combustor length is, we try to make it very short. You know that uh, if you augment the length, the residence time will be augmented more nitric oxides. Uh, if you augment the lengths, you augment the, uh, the axial, the axis which uh, relates the turbine to the compressor. You don't want that. So we make the combustor as short as possible. In addition, the pressure is very high, so the volume has, can be very small. And, uh, but however, in terms of radius, you cannot bring the radius to a small value. It's, uh, you, there is a, a certain radius. So as a consequence, the, the diameter is the largest dimension and the, the perimeter is even larger because you multiply by two pi. So the frequencies which are correspond to the azimuthal modes are the lowest. And so they fall in the region of uh, receptivity of the flames. So uh, this is why these azimuthal modes are, uh, are the, most, uh, the, the, the most dangerous in, in these systems. So these low frequency modes are also less well damped uh, than the longitudinal modes. Because the longitudinal modes are damped by the nozzles that, that are downstream and by uh, while the, what, what is azimuthal doesn't find anything to, to damp it. It's more, uh, uh, it's just a, an annulus, and so there is nothing much to, so, so these, these are, correspond to the lowest frequencies and also are less well damped. And so uh, uh, th this is why it raises scientific and technical issues. And on the scientific side, the, there were not too many uh, uh, experiments. A lot of what has been done in laboratories was done on, on simple flames like that. For example, we studied that swirling flames. You have theories, simulations, experiments, a large number of investigations. For the other systems, a theory is uh, pretty elaborate. A number of uh, papers, not so many as here, but uh, quite a few. In terms of experiments, uh, very few, uh, uh, well, there are some simulations, actually. There are a few, uh, but it's complicated because it's a full system. You have all these injectors. It's, uh, it's something uh, difficult. Let me take some water. And in terms of uh, experiments, actually there are very few uh, experiments on multiple injection systems and you, where you can actually visualize the flames. Uh, you want to be able to look at the dynamics of the flames here. So, uh, and the justification for that is again, here you have an annular geometry, multiple swirled injectors, so you want to have multiple swirled injectors. Uh, liquid phase injection, kerosene and air, for example, in these engines, or methane and air for gas turbines, high pressure. And of course, if you do an experiment, uh, you, you want first to do atmospheric pressures. It's much more difficult to go to high pressure. In the lab, uh, it's more dangerous. You need more, uh, the design is more complicated as soon as you go to high pressure. So anyway, you can start with the atmospheric pressure. Annular, 
multiple swirled injectors like here, premixed. It's easier to start with premixed. And afterwards, you can go to, uh, to uh, liquid uh, spray. So we, we've done that. And this is the combustor that we have. Uh, this was uh, designed by Daniel Durox. Uh, so we have a plenum which will bring the, the premixed air and propane to these injectors. Uh, we, we now have uh, liquid injection, heptane and air as well. Uh, this, this chamber has uh, 16 swirled injectors. Uh, there is a spark plug to start combustion. Uh, and uh, the plenum uh, has uh, plugs to put microphones and we can also place microphones on the chamber using the waveguide. It's, uh, it's the technique that I described yesterday. And uh, this is how it looks when it's operating. So th these are the spark plugs. They, uh, they, they become red, uh, but also in some cases we, we were igniting from above and like that, we didn't have any, any obstacles inside the, the combustor. Now there is a, another rig which was built and in fact totally independently. We didn't know that uh, people in Cambridge, uh, Jim Dawson and Nick Worth were building this device which is also annular. You see the, the combustion region. Uh, the design is, uh, is uh, somewhat different. First, you see the injectors are these big pipes, which is, doesn't look very much like what, what you have in, in a real engine. The plenum is very big here, and the diameter is about half the diameter that we selected here. So, so you have these two devices. Uh, one, one is this uh, uh, device developed at, uh, in Cambridge, and the other one is our device. Uh, they have the same open end, uh, atmospheric, but uh, the injectors here have a very small swell as well. So uh, in this respect, it's also not quite uh, representative of what we have in practice. The, the swell number is important, and in our case, it's a, a little closer to what we have in an engine. Uh, in addition, uh, what we do is we, we have also um, another device to look at a single injector. It's always important to be able to, to look at the multiple injector situation, but also to have the single injector. And, uh, and this looks like that. So it's not quite representative of the situation in, in the chamber, but it's close. Uh, in this case, we inject liquid here, heptane, but we, the same can be used for premixed air and propane. These two microphones are used to get the velocity and we can also place a hot wire here. We have driver units like that. We can study the, the uh, the, the describing function. So the, the objective is to actually measure this describing function in the case of a single injector and use that information uh, to analyze the data that we get in the annular situation. Um, this shows the various elements right here. All right. And the idea is that you see, you have these MICA experiments on this combustor. You observe instability. Take the single burner dynamics. Look at the FDF. Do some theoretical analysis. And then modify the injector in, in certain dimensions, swell number, head loss, for example. The head loss can be a parameter, a design parameter and then go back to Mika and do something like that. So uh, using on one side a single injector, on the other side the full multiple injector situation, it uh, gives you much more understanding that, than just having this device or that device. 
In fact, you can actually tailor your, you can try to, to have something unstable on the single injector and then place it on the multiple injector. And, and by using, uh, so you have to design a lot of swirlers. You, you change the swirlers or you change the, for example, you place a cup. You see here, uh, in, in some cases, we, we had a, a, an uh, exit cup to these injectors. Um, what you see here is mica uh, fed by uh, uh, propane and air, and you see there is a cup, and so the flames are expanding sideways, and they interact with each other, and we, we, we that, that's one interesting thing, is what is the effect of the cup angle on, the, on such uh, instabilities? So this shows some uh, design features. For example, the swirler, a detailed view of the swirler. Uh, you have, of course, to bring in the uh, air and propane. This comes through this manifold here. The swirlers are, uh, are right here. Uh, the, the dimension, the, the longitudinal dimension has to be sufficient so that the frequency is brought to a lower value because this actual component brings the frequency up. And so we need a frequency which is in the range where the flames are susceptible to instability. Uh, we can place a camera on the side to look at what happens. Uh, we have microphones sitting there. This is another view and we, have, we can have microphones uh, plugged on the chamber. You see a set of microphones as well as microphones plugged on the plenum. And this shows the cup. And we also use these uh, matrix injectors. Like that, uh, you can have laminar flames. So you have a, <coughs> the problem in the case of swirling flames is that the flame is turbulent. So you have turbulence, acoustics, multiple injectors, swirling flames, so it's complicated. So in, this one is a little simpler. You have uh, injectors which produce a set of conical flames. This is, a, uh, this is the place where you put the microphone. This, this is the plug. This is uh, where the, uh, the microphone exhaust, the, the, the waveguide exhaust. So we've seen the, uh, the, uh, this analysis already. So we have the frequencies here. And uh, let me show you now. So one thing which was unusual is that, uh, and this is true also for the, uh, for the work of uh, Jim uh, Dawson and uh, Nick Wurz, is that we were not able to get instabilities uh, when the walls, the two walls were at, of the same um, length. We had to have a wall which was half the length of the other one or something lesser than the other one. Uh, this, is, this gave us instability. For a while, we were not getting any instability. <laughs> so that was very disappointing. So uh, of course, when, when, you, uh, when you have some, uh, one problem like that, you have to try solutions. And um, first of all, what we did was to look at ignition problems because just to, uh, if, you are, uh, if you are not busy, it's not good. So you, we, we started uh, working on ignition and uh, there are many results on ignition. And then uh, Jim Dawson uh, uh, gave a presentation at the Combustion Institute and he was explaining that the walls were not equal. He had to use, so that's what we did. We put unequal walls and we got the instability. <laughs> So uh, you see the conferences are very important. You, you get an information. It's a very simple information, but uh, we got that from, from him. And so, uh, and, and uh, now when, you, do, when do you calculate the modes, now if you have two walls, one which is smaller than the other one, the mode is a little more complicated than what I've shown. And so you have to use uh, a Helmholtz solver. This is what is done here. 
uh, you have to include a temperature field, which is here, and you include all the geometry, and, uh, and, and you can calculate the, the longitudinal mode. The frequency is 280 hertz. So we, we got the longitudinal instabilities. These were immediately there. 252 uh, in, in the experiment, 280 in the calculation. Uh, there is another longitudinal mode that we didn't get experimentally. And we get this longitudinal, the first azimuthal mode. Uh, numerically, it's 770 hertz and experimentally 790. So we, we have a, a good representation of this mode. This is a standing mode here. You calculate that using console, and, uh, and this shows the distributions of these uh, modes in, uh, on the cylinder here. You, you look at the distribution. So, uh, so, so the modes can be identified, and there is this little thing which is weird that the wall here has to be about half of the, the outer wall. Uh, the more recent experiments, we now have instabilities also for the same lengths of the walls. We, we were able to get also very nice instabilities, very strong instabilities for the same uh, wall lengths. So we don't have to, do, to use this. But at first, for, for a few years, we were just using that. Why not? You know, the problem is to get the, the oscillations there and to get these uh, azimuthal oscillations. All right, so let's stop for a quarter of an hour and uh, relax, and uh, we'll look at the modes that we get and uh, how we analyze the data in this uh, situation. <laughs>